Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this installment of the Corbell webinar series. Today, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Michaela Meyerhofer from BBMRI Eric to present towards the GDPR Code of Conduct for Health Research. Where are we today? My name is Michelle Mendonca, and I'm involved in the Corbell project on behalf of Embel EBI. I will be hosting the webinar today and also be manning the question function. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, I want to make you aware that this uh, webinar is being recorded, including uh, the question and answer session at the end. It will be made available on the Corbell YouTube channel and website. Uh, we have reserved some time at the end of the session for questions and discussion. I would like to ask you to write your questions in the question function of the GoToWebinar control panel, as you can see on the slide. I would like to briefly introduce the Corbell project to you. Corbell is a, a Horizon 2020 funded project bringing together 13 research infrastructures in the biomedical science. Corbell aims to transform understanding of biological mechanisms and help translate them into medical care. Modern biological and biomedical research involves complex projects which often combine a variety of different technologies and operate at the interface between different disciplines. Corbell aims to help these projects by harmonizing access and services for research involving more than one research infrastructure, which could be biological and medical technologies, biological samples, and data services. Our presenter today is Michaela Meyerhofer. She is a political scientist and historian by training. She was educated in Vienna, Leuven la Neuve, Essex, and Paris. In 2010, she earned her PhD from both the École des Études en Sciences Sociales and the University of Vienna, which was shortlisted by the Austrian Society for Political Science for Best Thesis 2010. Prior to her involvement in BBMRI ERIC, she was an investigator in several national and international research projects, focusing on the politics of biotechnology and the life sciences, especially the governance of biobanks. Her academic career led to various positions at a range of institutes, and today she serves as the Chief Policy and Coordination Officer of BBMRI ERIC and coordinates the Code of Conduct for Health Research Initiative. At this point, I will hand over to Michaela. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, as you can see, uh, I can not only thank her, Michelle, for the nice introduction. Um, I'm always uh, two steps ahead, especially when it comes to my own presentation. Now, uh, starting um, with uh, where we are today with the Code of Conduct uh, for Health Research Initiative is uh, always good to uh, remember what is the starting point and what is a Code of Conduct. The general definition of a code of conduct is a set of rules outlining responsibilities of and or proper practices, practices for an individual defining in the sense what is expected, what is the path uh, in a specific organization or sector. The uh, code of conduct, according to the GDPR, Article 40, is more specific and uh, encourages to draw up codes of conduct that uh, are intended to contribute to the proper application of the regulation, taking into account specific um, necessities and features in the various processing sectors. In short, um, our sector, health research, um, is definitely one that requires um, guidelines and viewpoints and orientation in how to uh, properly applicate the regulation. Article 42 continues that associations and other bodies representing such categories of controllers or processes may prepare such code of conducts, uh, especially in regards to, and I pick only a few, fair and transparent processing, collection of personal data, the pseudonymization of personal data, um, notification of personal data breaches, uh, or the transfer of personal data to third countries or international organizations. The way uh, that uh, we as the drafting group uh, understand Article 40.2 is that a code does not necessarily need to uh, tick the boxes for all these um, categories listed here or the purposes for specifying the application listed here, but um, to pick a few that are uh, important and to follow them. <clears throat> 
And this is definitely the case for um, the research infrastructures such as uh, combined in or joining voice forces in the research project Corbell. Now, what I always like to do is uh, to point out that as early on what the code isn't. Uh, the code is um, definitely not the holy grail. Whatever you do out there to seek and uh, to be GDPR compliant, don't wait until um, this code or any other code uh, is out. Do your best to comply uh, to the GDPR. Um, talk to your data protection officer in your institutions. Um, do not overinterpret. Be um, sensible. My educated guess is, especially with the European institutions, that a lot of uh, processes are already in place, however, need some spring cleaning. So in this sense, uh, the code can be an important part of a building block and uh, puzzle piece that helps uh, to establish a comprehensive uh, solution and, uh, again, gives uh, orientation, especially when it comes uh, to transnational research. I would like to recall that uh, the Code of Conduct uh, for Health Research uh, aims, um, and here as any aims, should be um, should be straightforward to contribute to the proper application of the GDPR, taking into account the specific features of processing personal data in the area of health, health research, to be even more specific, um, to clarify and specify certain rules of the GDPR, especially for controllers who process personal data for purposes of scientific research in the area of health, to help demonstrate compliance by controllers and processes with the regulation and therewith simply also with the existence of the code and the adherence to it to help to foster transparency and trust in the use of personal data uh, processing in the area of health research. And on trust, um, I always like to add that I'm convinced that trust is nothing that can be uh, earned. It is something uh, that is given uh, initially by someone and you have to maintain it. Now, why again is um, the code interesting for uh, us for the research sector? Well, um, research is a hard nut to crack and uh, to combine and to uh, understand the implications of the GDPR for health research in the various countries uh, in particular is not an easy one. That said, research remains uh, the exception in, from a legal viewpoint. Um, you are allowed, um, you're not allowed to do certain things, but in research under certain conditions you are. Um, however, member states uh, can put in place uh, some additional derogations. And uh, this means that some countries are not applying any, whereas others uh, are applying a dozens. And this um, contributes that uh, we are far off from harmonization. And this makes the practical life of researchers and research endeavors um, quite a challenging one. Why is that? Of course, because research is borderless and we are living today in the era uh, in the era of open science. Now, the focus areas of the Code of Conduct for Health Research remain the same since the start. The focus lies on the lawfulness of processing what is my legal basis, the responsibility um, of the controller processor and their relationship to each other, especially in relation uh, to burden of proof and the guiding principle of accountability the appropriate safeguards, especially pseudonymization. Um, and this also requires uh, to say something about uh, anonymization um, of the data. And uh, the focus lies on being as practical as possible with references uh, to existing guidelines, which can also include um, ethical ones as these are important in our field. <clears throat> 
Now, all these focus areas, um, again, has to be re reminded, lie within the fact that research is the exception, um, is treated as an exception in the GDPR, and that um, harmonization to date is a myth. However, um, any myth is also a dream, and this is what, uh, in the long game, we should strive for. Now, when we look uh, on the processing of special categories of personal data, um, Article 9 uh, specifies that processing is forbidden uh, unless and uh, lists several categories. And here in bold, you find those that in the area of health research um, are uh, the most common ones that uh, several groups of countries are looking into. I guess um, what I want to point out uh, for the sake of time in this presentation is that um, it can be one of them, it can be uh, several of them, but what you cannot do is um, legal basis hopping or to really focus on, uh, you have to be aware and inform um, what you uh, choose your legal basis upfront. Now, when we come uh, to the structure of the code that has remained uh, the same since the start with a few uh, questions uh, being or sub headings being added. The uh, structure of the code is uh, an following an FAQ style. It uses as much as possible uh, non-legalistic language. And here um, we will still need some polishing for some sectors, uh, sections of the code before we can present them in, in the next webinar. And the questions build um, along uh, the workflow that uh, a researcher, the, the controller has um, when dealing uh, with uh, personal and sensitive data. So obviously the first question that we're asking is, am I handling personal and sensitive data? Um, if not, well, you have less to read. What I want to show now is uh, the example um, from the draft text as regards to legal basis and um, as regards to the question, what if consent is my legal basis for data processing? And here we have as rule eight, well, consent is one legal basis to process data as described by the GDPR in this code. And um, we clarify in an explanation why consent might be a potential legal basis for data processing, there with helping um, you as researchers to uh, identify if this is indeed the legal basis that you are following. Um, rule uh, nine and onwards are then describing um, the uh, requirements when consent is a legal basis, such as uh, unambiguous, specific, and so on. And whenever um, a rule is defined on a more concrete basis, we always put in a, an example. And here I um, put in a, a very easy one uh, that is <clears throat> consent um, is uh, meant to be unambiguous. So the easiest way is that uh, with a signature, a person is uh, giving the consent for um, data processing in a specific study. The current text on our uh, section of the code on consent um, is currently uh, around about 10 pages long. And um, we hope um, to um, present it uh, in the next webinar, um, in probably in uh, early fall. And it specifies um, all the details that in, you have to adhere to and consider when consent is your legal basis. When it comes to the country derogations, then um, we have to find a way how to include this, as this is also a prerequisite for the code, but uh, to that um, a bit later more. What is um, critical um, for us in the writing of it is also to flesh out the two aspects of consent, that it can be um, a legal basis uh, for data processing, but it uh, is also uh, an ethical instrument. And we find that uh, very often um, when we talk to each other, our language has not been clear uh, in dividing those two. 
So one um, aspect in the code is to flesh out what is the difference between consent as a legal basis and informed consent uh, to research participation. <clears throat> You see here uh, a general text that would be our explanation um, as regards to informed consent, um, also referencing uh, the Charter of uh, Fundamental Rights of the EU, uh, Helsinki and TAPE regulations that are uh, core ethical principles. But we point out that informed consent for research participation is not conceived as an instrument for data protection compliant, however, could be considered as an additional safeguard in the context of data protection law. And again, we want to give uh, then uh, an example. Why we pointed this out so um, vividly is if uh, you use consent as the legal basis for your data processing, you have to consider that um, there are rights from the individuals, um, data subjects, and uh, a withdrawal from consent. Um, a withdrawal from the consent could mean also the withdrawal from any data processing. Now, I've talked a little bit about the content. Um, however, the um, EDPB is quite clear that for the development of a code, content and governance are um, equally 50 50 um, the building blocks of the code. And that said, um, it means to have a more detailed look on the guidelines uh, presented by the EDPB. <clears throat> The guidelines were um, uh, on the codes of conduct and monitoring bodies under the regulation 2016-679 um, was um, put for public consultation until April 2019. Uh, the EDPB has received uh, several comments um, to them and um, has updated um, a couple of days ago, uploaded the most recent version of June 4th um, on its website. What it contains, as you can see here with the table of contents, are uh, an explanation in more detail what are codes, what are the benefits of the codes, um, what is the processing and territorial scope, <clears throat> the monitoring bodies, <coughs> the, oh <coughs> the oversight, um, um, mechanisms, the importance of national legislation, um, submission, admissibility and approval uh, of a national code in contrast to the submission, admissibility and approval uh, of a transnational code. Um, the role of the commission in this code, um, any conflicts of interests as, um, under the section accreditation requirements for monitoring bodies. So in short, what you see is it is um, a 30 page serious document highlighting um, the details of uh, governance, monitoring bodies, uh, transparent rules, and um, what is expected to ensure um, that the monitoring uh, can be fulfilled. <clears throat> when I move, <clears throat> when I move uh, further uh, and take a few sections from the guidelines, um, the uh, EVP specifies that a code must be submitted by an association, consortium of associations or other bodies represented in categories of controllers and processors. Um, they name it here code owners. Again, in uh, accordance with Article 40.2 um, of uh, the GDPR, and provides as examples um, trade and representative associations, sectoral associations, academic ac uh, associations, and interest groups. Um, this is equally true for uh, a national and a transnational code. In any case, um, our initiative would um, be eligible to uh, be a code owner. So if, which this requirement is not a surprise to us. When we then move to the um, monitoring body, um, the monitoring body is, is defined as a body or committee or a number of bodies of committees internal or external to the code owners who carry out monitoring function to ascertain and assure that the code is complied to as per Article 41. And uh, this um, 
is of great importance uh, and one of the biggest questions that we yet have to tackle, how we can assure uh, in the research community uh, the compliance of the code. Whether and on which granular level um, self-assessments um, are a possibility uh, or um, does everybody have, has to be audited or is it something that we can follow up on a case-by-case -case, um, basis as always costs are attached to that as well. <clears throat> What is uh, discussed in several groups um, that are developing other codes is that um, here uh, the, uh, the EDPB is expectantly um, open to uh, what is a good practice in the sector as long as compliance to the code can be uh, seriously monitored. Thus, the draft code must propose mechanisms that uh, <clears throat> allow <clears throat> the serious monitoring of the compliance with the uh, provisions of the stakeholders who undertake to apply it. And uh, here, <clears throat> again, the um, uh, guidelines are specific. This applies to both public and non-public sector codes. Ultimately, and I think this is going to be uh, for the health research uh, the most uh, the, one of the most difficult parts, is that the code owner must provide a confirmation that uh, the draft code is in compliance with the relevant national legislations, in particular where the code involves a sector which is governed by specific provisions set out in national law. And this is definitely the case um, in research. Um, just picking out this, the example as it is close uh, closest to me, um, when you consider biobanking um, as a practice is uh, governed in some countries by a set of law or um, a specific law even, uh, such as uh, in Finland. And how to take uh, this into account to make the code uh, of European value is uh, going to be um, a time challenge. Now, uh, I also added here on this slide, um, Appendix 4 uh, from the guidelines, it specifies um, the tra transnational code flowchart. And what you see is, uh, in essence, that uh, you have to turn in the code in uh, um, a country where basically a national um, DPA um, defines um, or uh, deems that the code is of transnational value and is then uh, discussed at the EDPB level. What you also see is that um, for the formal assertion whether the code um, is of transnational level, the uh, time frame is relatively um, short and expectantly uh, will take a couple of weeks um, as um, expected that there's always a back and forth. However, um, the um, details, if it is discussed, and uh, how often um, the um, opinion uh, can be, how the opinion of endorsing a draft decision uh, or amendments for the draft will be done, there is no timeline. Uh, my educated guess would be that this will take, uh, if it is on the ADPB level in our case, um, a couple of, uh, of months, at least um, three to half a year. That is already quite uh, an optimistic one. That said, um, I'm pretty much an incurable um, optimist and uh, need to state that one of the reasons why we're uh, still working on uh, the code before publication is again um, due to the fact to the EU member state implementation. Consider for instance here um, the status of um, May 22nd, 2018 was that eight EU member states were not ready to fully enforce the general data protection um, at that time. And that is um, now a year past. 
Even today, there are a couple of countries who just recently, such as the Czech Republic, um, implemented the GDPR in fullest, and some national discussions about the interpretation are still ongoing on a, a DPA and expert level. I also recall um, a statement um, as regards to the uh, national data protection authorities uh, a year ago, where the then um, French um, head of uh, the um, we were saying that the national data protection um, authorities are have troubles adhering uh, to the code because they're uh, adhering to the GDPR. Forgive me, um, because the um, resources um, were not there. So most of uh, the national DPDAs have been granted serious resources. Um, our uh, training staff, but uh, in a lot of countries, there's not yet um, a, a good person to talk to on a DPA level um, for research. In other countries, um, however, there is, and here I want to point out um, uh, France or Belgium or uh, the Netherlands. <clears throat> now, as regards to timeline and next steps, this is always subject to change. And I think the biggest learning curve that we as a drafting group had, um, we were uh, fairly optimistic of being able uh, to have a decent draft to be sent to you uh, within a year. Um, now, looking back at the process, uh, we changed our strategy and um, started to work on sections of the code and uh, have begun to present it uh, to some peers and some smaller reference groups and will extend this um, as the year goes on and very likely continue this in 2020. This means that, for instance, a section uh, on the draft code on consent, which consists then of a, uh, about 10 pages, um, will be presented at the meeting in the webinar um, to um, a group of people um, and organizations and the comments uh, are um, reworked and will feed into the reworking of the code. Um, what we also uh, have started to do is uh, to start a more extensive dialogue with other groups that are drafting a code, either on the European, but also national and sectoral level. On the European level, so far, uh, the Code of Conduct for Health Research is the only one um, focusing on, um, on, on the sector of research or health research. Um, however, there are a couple of other codes who equally uh, pose the same question as regards to governing and monitoring. And uh, here we have a loose group uh, to meet up and exchange. So, for instance, um, discussing how, the, um, how we see and understand uh, the guidelines by the EDPB. On another level, um, there are some uh, national or sectoral codes developed. So, for instance, um, some universities already have a code of conduct in place, however, not GDPR compliant, and are updating it. Um, this provides uh, a nice example, um, as even if there is an existing code, also updating uh, a code is a process of uh, several months, and all the activities I'm aware of, um, it was uh, at least uh, half a year to reach to a draft code. Um, or up amended code uh, that can be presented to a wider audience. Lastly, on a national level, I would like to point out um, the code that my colleagues from um, Poland are drafting. Poland does not have a specific biobank law. Again, I'm using uh, a biobank uh, example as BBMRI is the research infrastructure for biobanks. Um, and uh, the reason um, why uh, they also opted for a code is um, that um, Poland does not have a national law. And here uh, the hope is that um, with the multiple laws and regulations that are out there, the code can help um, to. Um, to a better understanding. Um, 
Um, the Polish colleagues had uh, presented uh, a draft version of the code um, at our European Bibank Week uh, last year, and uh, they have clarified that they go for uh, the legal basis of consent, again, as uh, they feel that this is the, the best way forward um, for within Poland. This might be true in one country, but might not be uh, in, in another country. And um, my guess is I've uh, seen um, a, an, a first English translation of a draft code that in the next couple of months um, there will be um, a, a broader consultation, but uh, in Poland, obviously, on the code. I guess what I want to say at this point as well is uh, congratulations to my colleague because uh, the document is quite uh, comprehensive and uh, useful for the community. But again, um, or only on a national level with a very clear singular legal basis, um, the process of drafting took um, a bit more than a year and is not finished yet. Now, coming back um, to the timeline and next steps for the Code of Conduct for Health Research is um, that we uh, have internally um, discussions about what would be the best way uh, for uh, a monitoring body, how uh, the adherence can take place. And um, expectantly, we will take uh, a decision uh, on this by the end of the year, beginning of next year. Um, here, the discussions with other groups uh, developing a European code is the most uh, beneficial as um, it is important uh, to have a monitoring that is not uh, a burden, but for the community um, is not cost intensive, uh, intense and resource intense, but equally so uh, allows uh, a decent monitoring as it is meant to be. Well, once um, we have um, received, presented and then received comments to sections of the draft code, we will uh, rework uh, our own draft code a couple of times and then issue uh, a public consultation. Um, my guess at this point is that we'll have it in at least one round and uh, um, in 2020. There are still some hopes uh, to do it by the end of the year, uh, but here for once, I'm not the optimist anymore. Then, of course, we'll follow the uh, submission to the UDPB via National um, Data Protection Authority, again, earliest 2020. What cannot be pointed out often enough is um, a code uh, being written is, um, with a couple of people relatively easy. What is the tricky part is to do it right and to reach um, adherence, the buy-in, that it really serves the community that it is intended for and ultimately uh, the acceptance and approval by the EDPB. And um, in, with this, I would look forward um, to a long uh, question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Michaela. Um, so we will have a little bit of time for questions now. If you have a question, please add them to the question function of the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, while you have a question to write them, we allow people to submit questions in advance. So we'll start with those. Uh, so Michaela, my first question to you is, um, can you envision a code of conduct for US academic and nonprofit institutions? Mm. For nonprofit institution, yes. For uh, US academic institutions, um, not at this stage, as um, not from the European side. As the European interpretation of the code is still ongoing, I would only see the possibility to have such a code between the US and uh, some countries. However, okay. in our discussion, um, we are um, aiming and finding ways how to include uh, third countries uh, in the code, at least to describe the pathway and to make, uh, whenever there is an amendment possible, um, an easy route for it. Um, that said, um, when we exchanged loosely with the EDPB, uh, the recommendation was to um, draft the code in a way um, that 
an amendment is not something that we're looking for because then the whole procedure would start again. Um, and I know that uh, it is important for um, several um, US uh, institutions, especially NIH, where the contractual clauses um, are uh, not uh, easily implemented, but that would be the easier road than code at the moment. Okay, uh, my second question is, will the code of conduct include statements on transfers outside of the EU? Um, yes, it will. It will uh, include um, statements and link to wherever uh, guidelines are out there in the community. Um, when, uh, when those are already deemed best practice models from the community. That said, um, the GDPR uh, allows for, um, well, one is, is a code, then contractual clauses, then an adequacy decision. And then the adequacy decision, just as an example, um, has been uh, put forward between um, the EU and Japan, where, um, on a high level, um, the countries or um, uh, Japan and uh, the EU agree that the um, respective regulations on uh, data protection are equal and adequate to each other and thus um, an exchange is e easily possible. So if an adequacy decision is in place, then the exchange is far easier and it would not need um, uh, to go further into detail. How it works then on, in, on, in practice, uh, as we all know, uh, with everything, is always something different. So um, I can only recommend uh, to everyone, um, take your time, uh, keep on talking um, to uh, DPAs, uh, keep on talking with, you, with each other and show uh, as best as you can the compliance and the appropriate safeguards in place. Okay, uh, my next question is, who will be a monitoring body for this code of conduct? Uh, who will be uh -huh. an accredited body to monitor a code, of, uh, a code for public sector? Mm. Um, this is a, a question that cannot uh, be generally answered for the Code of Conduct for Health Research. Um, we are currently exploring of uh, teaming up with another organization that already adheres um, or is the monitoring body um, of another uh, code or aims to be a monitoring body of another code uh, for e-health. Then uh, the second option is uh, to build a society that adheres the code or to set up an internal committee. And uh, the least favorable um, as regards to the Code of Conduct for Health Research for me at the moment, uh, but the assessment is not yet completed, is uh, an internal body as uh, we are uh, largely publicly funded institutions and um, have, um, have the need to have an oversight body um, where we can go into also uh, as the network that we're representing. We do not have the possibility um, to make uh, in a lot of cases internal uh, monitoring as we do not have the control over it. I take here the example of uh, universities um, universities would have uh, the possibility to do internal monitoring within our loose network that is much harder. So I'm uh, afraid that I cannot give a definite answer on that yet, um, but uh, the um, society uh, teaming up with a body um, that uh, focuses on e-health and um, <clears throat> internal is one of the ways. I know that in the sector of, um, for several companies, um, they go the internal route. And we've got, I've got here a question saying, don't you think that the health research is too unfocused as a scope for this code? Uh -huh. um, indeed, um, the health research is uh, on the title, so there has to be, in the end, um, a focus taking place, and that is something that we hope um, in getting with uh, getting the feedback from the community once we start uh, presenting the sections and the public consultation.
Okay. My apologies if I repeat a question, but um, mm -hmm. so to clarify, the GDPR allows the code of conduct to be an independent basis for transfer rather than standard contractual clauses or the other means listed. Has BBMRI Eric considered establishing a basis to transfer as part of the proposed code of conduct? Um, BBMRI, we have uh, with our uh, within our own network uh, some standard uh, contracts in place, and we are currently discussing of um, including the one or the other in annexes, and the same for other sectors as well. Um, we have other research infrastructures uh, in um, in the drafting group of the code uh, as well. Um, uh, uh, representatives from the industry via via FBA that equally deal with um, the transfer of uh, data for health research. Okay, and then there's a question about how large the group is that's contributing to drafting the code. I'm assuming mm -hmm. that's the core group rather than where you mentioned that you go to smaller groups for, for feedback. Yeah. Uh, it's about uh, 10 people at the moment, and uh, if you go to the um, website, uh, Code of Conduct for Health Research, uh, the people are then listed by name. The group came together in one of the first uh, stakeholder meetings that we did um, about, I think, a year and a half ago in Brussels. Okay, thank you. We've then also got a question where um, it says you've mentioned the difference in consent for the use of personal data and mm. an ethical informed consent. Does that mean that the code will advise to ask both consent to people separately? Not necessarily. It has just to be made clear that these are two separate things, um, how it is uh, handled in, in uh, several areas is that you have two tick boxes. Yes, I consent to data processing uh, very briefly. And uh, yes, I uh, accept that my data can be used. Uh, I give my consent to research. I'm happy to participate um, in uh, the research. So it can be on one paper, it does not have to be two different consent forms. Okay, that will definitely help. Um, then we've also got, how do you envisage cooperation with other initiatives in the area of clinical research? I guess that's quite wide because it probably depends a little bit on what other initiatives. <laughs> Exactly. Um, well, for, for the time being, it is um, a dialogue. Um, and then uh, in the dialogue, if something concrete comes out of there, or if there are already, um, say, uh, some best practices or uh, templates out there that uh, can help and can be referenced in the code, then this is what we're going to do. Um, here, the EDPB advised us um, whenever possible um, to not include things in the annex that are subject to change um, by the community uh, rather frequently, but to reference um, always to the latest version. And um, with this way forward, um, it, it can be practical. I mean, what the overall idea of the code definitely is, is not, um, to reinvent the wheel anew, and if something good is already out there, to um, signpost to it. Okay, we've got a question here. I think it's kind of half answered, but the second half isn't, so I'm going to add it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, who will be the code owners, and what corporate group is the code targeting? Mm. Um, the code owners, as I see it now, would all uh, would be um, all the organizations that uh, are currently drafting it and then adhere to the code. Uh, and here again, we have to set up um, a body that uh, ensures and specifies the ownership. So uh, here we likely have more information in fall. It cannot be BBMRI alone. That is for me quite clear. Uh, if the code is a comprehensive one, um, then uh, it can also be theoretically an independent body, but we just drafted it and then handed it over to somebody else uh, for the adherence. Mm 
Um, the <clears throat> corporate group um, is for the time being rather ambitious because we said in the drafting of it, um, we want to have it as wide as possible uh, and as inclusive as possible, and then to narrow it down, especially when we come down to the governance. So everybody who would sign up to the code um, would be um, um, signing up to the adherence and the code owner ultimately will also depend in how we are setting up um, the, the monitoring body. What I can say again is it cannot be, in my opinion, uh, BBMRI alone because then we are leaving out um, many other organizations and maybe it should even be an independent body. We were even forming a consortium that is then the code owner. But this is still up for uh, discussion as the guidelines are relatively fresh. Would you envisage to have formal accreditation or more a monitoring or self um, assessment? Um, <clears throat> I personally uh, would think a combination of the two. Um, and that accreditation is simply when I look again at our uh, biobanking. Um, constituency, so to say. Uh, BBMRI has 500 biobanks in our directory. If uh, all 500 of them uh, want to adhere to the code and sign up for it, um, then uh, to give an accreditation of them is also a cost issue if we really do uh, an audit system uh, which has also to be regulatory, regularly monitored. So um, I think that uh, a self-assessment in combination with a um, a couple of audits uh, across um, the biobanks spontaneously that can um, that can be envisioned. It uh, again should not place a burden, um, but it should be a tool um, where compliance is possible. And here we are uh, discussing um, with uh, some other code uh, sectors and how to do that. And um, again, I hope to have more in autumn here. What I will um, do, because I want to update uh, regularly and hear the Corbel um, webinar is just a fantastic tool, is um, to note down these questions to make them the topic of my next webinar. Guessing that I'm getting invited again, of course. <laughs> I think we can, we can arrange that. Mm -hmm. um, then we've got um, two more questions to end. One is, does the code discuss basis for processing for secondary research purposes? Mm. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, and this will be one of the most crucial uh, things. And uh, as the discussion is ongoing in the community for quite a while, you can um, you see probably why we have not uh, yet been able to, um, to present anything about that yet. But secondary use is one of the hot topics, definitely. Okay, and then um, the last question we have is, could you give an example of differences between ethical consent and data processing consent? The easiest example, I think, is when it comes uh, to clinical trials, because typically in clinical trials, um, you consent that you partake in a clinical trial, and uh, this is the uh, ethical instrument then. Um, you can withdraw at any point in time uh, the consent, and you are no longer part of uh, the clinical trial. However, when um, the legal basis for um, for clinical trials uh, data processing is not um, typically not consent, it is uh, the clinical trials regulation. And here um, the advantage is, as the legal basis for data processing is the clinical trial regulation, uh, the data that has been used for processing is kept uh, in the study, can be processed, is not threatening the study, although uh, the ethical instrument of consent has been withdrawn by the participant who is no longer participating. Okay, we haven't got um, any more questions submitted. So in that case, um, I want to thank you, Michaela, for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it was great to, to see that many questions. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending.
So the Corbell webinar series will go on a summer break um, after this, and we're planning to be back in September. So keep an eye on the website, um, and we'll announce the next webinar there. Um, it will take us a couple of days to um, to edit this webinar, but it should be available um, hopefully uh, next week. And obviously on the on the website, we've also got uh, our previous webinars and we'll let you know when we have um, the next update as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vera and Michelle, for organizing.